five most frequent React interview questions, and they actually cover up all the fundamentals of React. And if you actually understand these five, that means you're basically understanding how React works from rendering to basically SSR to global state management and pretty much everything that you need to know. The first question, or the first most frequent React interview question is how to pass data from child to parent. We all know that React has actually the parent child flow diagram of like data flowing. So like it flows from the parent, which is, you know, always on the top and it flows down to the child. But now how do we take it actually the data? How, if, let's say a child wants to communicate with the parents and actually send a piece of data from the child to the parent. How can we do that? So let's imagine we've got this simple React component which is called the parent component that has a child called child component. And that inside of the child, we've got like an input. So what we want is actually whatever we put inside of the input, we want to send that piece of data from the child right into the parent. So how can we do that? So simply just declare a state in here on the top and you declare the state on the parent, for example, in here, you know, just to be able to receive the data from the actual child. So you do like data from child and set data from child, you create a simple handler that is like handle data from child, that's going to receive the actual data received from the child and actually update the state with that piece of data. And simply in here on the GSX, you just pass in the send data to parents, and you just bind it with your handle data from child callback, which means you're just basically grabbing the data and actually just setting the data on your own local state. So now on the child in here, we just simply have an input and everything. But also like whenever we do on change, that means whenever every single keystroke that happens to be on the input. So every single keystroke in here, we do actually through props so we call props because this is actually being passed through props, the send data to parents, we call a through props in here and we pass in the value we want to send back to our parent. And of course, the value is going to be like whatever we type inside of the like particularly the input in here, and everything is going to flow up into the parent component here and is going to be stored locally into the data and everything is going to flow up into the parent component here and is going to be stored locally into the data from child state. And now of course, we can use the data from child state in here to basically render whatever we want. And later on, of course, we can go ahead and render the data from child state in here to actually, you know, showcase and display the data received from the child component. So this is basically what our example looks like. We've got a parent component here on the top. Right now, for example, the child input in here is empty. So we've got nothing. But if you type something on it, like hello from the other side or something, you're going to have basically it's just going to flow on every single keystroke. So like on every single keystroke you type in here, it's going to flow back into the parent. And that's how you basically pass data from child to parent. The second question is how to render an element outside of the component scope or the components tree. For example, let's imagine we've got this real simple component here, which is called render element outside tree. And inside of that, we've got a div and inside of the div, we got a paragraph and a button. So that means wherever we're actually going to render this element, those two, like the paragraph and the button, are actually going to render inside of the tree, depending on where we place that particular component. So for example, for our case in here, we're actually placing the render element side tree inside of the GSX up in here, which means basically inside of the root, inside of like the main element in here. Of course, for our up component, if we go to the main.gsx, the up component is going to be directly rendered inside of the root. And if we track back the root, the root is basically, you know, a div inside of the body in here. So the body is actually, you know, the parent of all DOM nodes, then actually it comes right after it, the root in here. And of course, we render all of our React components and elements inside of React. And of course, we render all of our React elements and components inside of this root container. So now from this element, what we want is actually want to render a particular element, let's say we want to render a paragraph, but instead of rendering it inside of the root in here and inside of the tree, we want to render it directly to the body from this component. I mean, you might probably thinking, oh, that's not really passable. How am I supposed to do that? Or why not just go ahead and have another component and just like put another DOM node in here and actually say, oh, you can render it over here. But like for us, actually React provides a really, really nice API that is called portals that allows you to do exactly that easiest way possible. So with portals, we can actually go ahead and import the create portal function or method from the React DOM. That's basically going to allow us to render a child component or a child react element in here. And actually the second argument will specify where to render it particularly. So here we're actually grabbing the DOM node in here by doing document get elements by ID and we do model. 
to grab this model in here. So that means it's going to grab us this reference to this particular DOM node that has an ID of model in here. And we're just going to render this paragraph right inside of it. So technically, this paragraph is not going to be placed in between the first paragraph and the button, but instead it's going to be completely placed outside of the current tree. So if we go ahead and look at it, there you go. So we've got the first paragraph in here. This is actually the last button in here. And the one that actually is specified using a portal, it's actually being rendered completely outside into the modal container. This child is placed inside the document body in here. And if we try to look into it, if we go inspect in here, go to elements. Now, if we look inside of the body in here, inside of the body, we got the roots, which has pretty much everything. And if you look at the model, the model basically has this. So it has the paragraphs we are rendering using our portal. And that's simply how you render a component or elements outside of the React tree. The third one is how to implement code splitting in your React app and why. And by code splitting in here, we also mean lazy loading of React components. So that basically the same, the question in here covers both of the topics. So lazy loading is basically deferring loading components code until it's rendered for the first time. And that's basically used when you have a lot of components and a big project or mid sized projects, and you lazily load components on demand, only on demand, to basically make the main bundle of the application or the website smaller and actually easier to be loaded when you know the, the website is firstly visited by a person or something and only load those functionalities, those extra functionalities or extra components when they are needed on demand. So lazy loading in here is officially supported by React, of course, and it has an API for it that's called lazy loading. It has a function that allows us to do that and suspense and everything. And it uses JavaScript promises behind the scenes to handle the lazy loading components. So for example, in here, we've got this simple component in here called lazy load model. And let's imagine this one has actually a button where it allows you when you click on that button, it's called like open model. So when you click on it, it opens a particular model or a dialogue for you. And let's say we want this dialogue to be only lazy loaded when the button is clicked. So like when this component is rendered, the model is not going to be loaded whatsoever. It's only going to be loaded when the button is clicked and the model is about to be opened. Let's say, for example, this model has a lot of code that we don't want to actually initially load into our bundle to make our website or React application lightweight and smaller and easier to be loaded, you know, over the network and everything. And of course, our model component here is just a normal component. If you go inside of components, model.gsx in here, just a normal component. It uses GSX to render stuff with Tailwind and stuff like that. So it's pretty easy, pretty simple. And the way to lazy load is actually using the lazy function that is actually going to be imported from React. So you do lazy, you actually return a callback on it. So you do a callback in here and you do import component model. Now, you don't need this delay for demo because I'm actually just delaying this just to see the demo. But the simple you need to do is actually use the import and you use the import as a function, not like the normal import we are used to do, but import with a function in here that's going to actually return a promise for you and you give it the path of the component that you want to lazy load. And this will return a promise. If you look into this, it's going to be a promise. And it's going to only be loaded when you actually call and render this model component. Now, the way you use model in here, and the way to render the lazy loaded model or other component you actually lazy load in is by just calling it and putting it inside of suspense. So you import suspense in here from react suspense basically allows you to display and render a full back UI like a loading UI while this model is lazily loaded over network because of course, this is not going to be loaded initially, it's only going to be loaded on demand. That means the JavaScript script code and the bundling is going to be only loaded when this model is about to be rendered. And the model here is going to be rendered only when we click on the button and when this show model is going to turn to true. So that means this suspense is actually going to go ahead and display as fullback UI in here. We're displaying just like a small loading text in here while code for the motor is loading. Once it's loaded, it's going to just like the motor is going to completely replace the loading here. So if you look at it real quickly on the example in here, if you click on the open motor example, we see loading here while the code is loading. And once it's loaded, we're going to find and actually see we're going to have our model being rendered for us by react. And when we implement lazy loading, that's what's actually going to enforce code split in of our components. So for instance, in here, because we are lazy loading the model. So if we go and actually see our build directory, because we're using Vite in here, and actually, you know, Vite is going to generate and build all the JavaScript on React in here, and going to just turn it into a JavaScript code in here for the browser. So we're going to find a couple of assets in here, we're going to find the index, which is the main file in here that has all the code for the whole website and all application. And because we're lazy loading the model in here, it created a separate JavaScript file for it, 
which means a separate bundle and it did you know this is what i mean by code splitting so you split the code of the model into a completely separate file that could be lazy loaded on demand and that's going to make your application run faster and get loaded faster. And if you want to double check if it's lazy loaded or not, you can go to the network tab in here and actually refresh, you're going to find all the JavaScript in here being loaded for you. But if you actually go ahead and clear and try to click on open model, you're going to find the model.gsx only gets loaded when you click on the open model button, which means it's being lazy loaded and you have a react code splitting work as charm. Fourth question is, what is the best way to add a global store to a react app or project? And I think the best answer for this kind of question is it depends on exactly what library the team wants to use for of course, managing the global state, because there are so many libraries, it actually depends on exactly the circumstances and what the team wants, and what actually works best for the projects. And of course, the two most used and frequent libraries in here, and I'm going to talk about the first one here, because that's pretty much used everywhere, which is Redux. And I know a lot of you actually already know Redux. And it probably like 90% of the time Redux is going to be the answer for most of the questions like that. So Redux is pretty good. It's pretty accurate. It's it's wild and it's used everywhere. And it's easy to integrate and everything. Or the second one, which is actually coming really, really well, like these last days, it's called Zustand, which is very integrated to work with React and React hooks and everything. And it's super, super simple to use and set up in just a couple of seconds. So I'm going to start with Redux in here. For Redux, there's actually a Redux toolkit, which is another library that uses Redux behind the scenes, but actually provides optionated sort of setup that allows you to easily set up Redux because Redux is a little harder and actually has some dependencies to install and everything. But using the Redux toolkit is going to be super easy easy for for you to set up and actually use Redux inside of your projects. So for instance, in here for our projects in here, we have two implementations. So Redux in here for simply what you need to do is actually create first a slice. So of course, after installing Redux toolkit and everything, you have to install Redux toolkit and actually go ahead and create a slice. It's sort of like a slice of your global store. So you imagine your global store has many slices and each slice in here is just like an object that has a lot of properties and function or particularly methods. So for example, in here, I've got theme slice, which is has a name has an initial state with a mode light in here, whether it could be dark or light theme, and it has some reducers in here. Now reducers are simply methods that actually are going to be called by the react component actually trigger a state change in here, which means going to they change, for example, the mode in here from light to dark or vice versa. So you simply create this stars in here, you create another file that's called store and you actually import that reducer, of course, you do export default theme slice reducer, you grab it in here to configure store from the redox JS to kit that's going to actually you create a store for you. And of course, you can add in here as many slices as you want. And once you have got the store, you go ahead and actually import a provider from react redux, which of course, you need to install as well. And you do provider, you provide the store you just created in here, and you provide all your elements that you want to use or have access to that particular store. Like for example, the theme toggler in here. And the theme toggler is actually, of course, our component that wants to have access to our global store, which can actually go ahead and use this too, which is use selector to actually select a slice of the state, for example, it's going to have four access to the state and can access the mode from our theme slice or the dispatch in here to actually to dispatch an action. And of course, those actions in here can be imported as well from the theme slice in here, the actions you just created as well. So you do dispatch toggle theme in here. And whenever this change theme in here is going to be called, which is called exactly when the input is checked in here, like a checkbox when it's checked, it's going to change the theme from light to dark or vice versa. And that's what you're going to get in here. For example, dark mode in here, if you click on this, it's going to activate the dark mode in here. If you click on it, it's going to deactivate and back and forth in here. And all the data in here, the whole state is saved on a global store and any component at any time can access that piece of state. Now, if you want to use Zustand, that's basically the same thing, but it's actually a lot simpler. So Zustand in here, you just install Zustand, you import the create function in here, you do create, you're going to have a set and get function. And this just basically you return an object. And then inside of that object, you put all your properties in here, which going to be, of course, going to represent the state, for example, the mode in here could be light or dark. And you can, of course, put all your methods inside the methods actually going to toggle or be able to access and actually change the state. For example, this toggle thing is actually going to go with the set and it's going to set the mode depending on exactly what is the current one. It's kind of like inverse it. And the same thing in here for the Zustand theme toggler, the component here that has access to this, you just do use app store, which is our 
you know, hook we created using the create method from Zustain, and we just do use up story, we grab the state in here, we grab the mode, and we do toggle theme in here to actually access to the toggle function. And whenever we call it, that's actually going to toggle the theme and actually change that on the Zustain store. And of course, for Zustain, you can basically create as many stores as you want. All of them are very lightweight, very independent, and they work perfectly. And of course, as I said, global state management in React is, is a vast thing with many libraries and many options to choose from and to do with depending on the main goal of your project and your team, and of course, your preference as well. Fifth, and the last question in here, let's say for example, he asks you to give me an example of a basic React SSR implementation. So always in the React realm in here, whenever we talk about SSR, the first thing that comes to our heads is actually basically the Next.js framework, which is a huge framework used by millions of developers out there that does SSR and it does it perfectly with so many great features. So maybe you want to outline that there is the type of frameworks that already does SSR like Next.js or Remix or something like that. And you outline this like very big frameworks. And of course, you can give him a very simplified version of an SSR React application with like Node.js, Express.js with React. So for example, when you have a simple project in here that does show how SSR works. And I said before, SSR is just like server side rendering. So it has to involve a server behind the scenes that actually compiles your React code and send it back to the client or the browser to render that particular React code. So in here to have SSR, you have to set up a simple project that uses Express JS and React, and you basically install a couple of dependencies like Express, React, React DOM. And here I chose to use ES build in here to compile our project. Of course, you can use whatever you want. You can use Webpack, Babel, but I think ES build is really perfect for that kind of case scenario because actually basically can compile everything very easy and has a super easy API to follow and work with. So I would really recommend going with that if you want to implement this in an interview. Next in here, you just simply have a React or a simple ExpressJS application in here that you know serves static files from the disk in here and actually uses the up router in here to do up.get to serve our React component and HTML file in here whenever the server is hit. So here we're setting it on the root of the server, you, root you run of the server. We're going to go ahead and read the file, which is the index.html, which is right over here inside of the public. And of course, this is just a simple index.html in here that has basically nothing, but it has this ID in here, root, which of course we're going to render our React component that are inside of the SRC right inside of it. So we're going to use the server in here. We're going to read the data from the index.html in here. We're going to grab the data and make sure there is no error. And last but not least, we're going to render, do like response send. And here we're going to replace the root element in here with the root element. But this is actually the important part in here you have to focus on where you do React DOM server, which is you import it from React DOM forward slash server, and you call the render to string, which is a method provided by the React team in here to be able to render your React components into a string that could be sent back from a server response. So that means render to string in here, it takes a React component like our application in here. And of course, our op.gsx in here has a simple React component that uses states that renders a simple GSX in here, it uses on click pretty much anything where you could do react normal stuff. And you just render that one. And of course, here is going to be converted into a string and it's going to be sent back from the server to the client. So the browser can render our website. And here, of course, you just do list and import, for example, 3000 or something to start the server. Now, another crucial part in here is actually to make sure you build your server and client in here using ES build, otherwise they won't work and won't compile. So you have to do go ahead and do build client in here. Like we have scripts in here. I'm using ES build to build the index JS in here and the server and actually bundle them out inside of the build directory. So later on, I can use the start script in here to basically start our express JS server. So simply just do yarn build server. That's going to build your server and yarn build client as well. And last but not least, you just do yarn start to start a server. It's going to be listed in on 3000. Now if you go to local 3000, you click on it, you're going to get your react application in here that is server side rendered. And of course it works perfectly whenever, for example, you click on the button, the state and the counter changes perfectly. And as a proof to make sure that it's actually really server side rendered, it's not like a client side application or something and to showcase to the interviewer that you basically understand exactly what's happening. You just, you're not just copy pasting code like chat GPT or something. So you go to the network tab in here and actually head over to the local host, which is of course where you know, the main HTML 
gets returned back. So you go to local host in here, and make sure, you know, this is the root of your website. You go to preview, there's actually you get the HTML that's returned back from the server and rendered on the browser. You go to response and you look at the HTML in here. That's exactly the HTML you have. So it has the root in here, but if you see in here, that's actually was rendered by React. So this is actually our React component, our component particularly that was rendered right over here. That means server side rendered. And of course, this was sent back from the server so that works perfectly. And later on, of course, if you notice in here, we've got a bundle.javascript in here that gets sent back. And this bundle.javascript is actually what makes this particular button in here works where hydration works particularly. It's like you can click on the button and have this JavaScript work. This bundle.js is very crucial. Of course, this bundle.js is actually what gets compiled by using bundle or build client in here, ES build, and you build the index.js in here. And if you look at the index.js, it has and it uses a special function. And you also to make sure you actually know that one is it uses the React DOM hydrate and it takes the root node of a React up in here, or you know, the main components that was rendered before on the server. You have to provide the one here as well, and you provide the node what it was rendered before. And have that actually inside of the root node. And that will all the way to hydrate and actually activate the JavaScript with the rendered HTML from the server. So the JavaScript can work and of course can make your application interactive by, you know, of course, you can click on the buttons in here, you can change and you can have everything working as expected with JavaScript. So that was the most frequent React interview questions in here. So thank you guys for watching. Really hope you guys enjoyed. Let me know in the comments if you really like this video. I can do more frequent React or X technology sort of questions for your interviews and stuff. Anyway, guys, see you hopefully in the next ones.